Hello and welcome to Narayana Eyes. I am Pratik, your faculty for daily news analysis. Now students, as part of daily news analysis, we shall be discussing five important topics from the Hindu and the Indian Express. So let's have a quick brief over the topics that we shall be discussing in today's session. The first article is taken from Indian Express page number 12. Now students, in this article, we are going to understand the reasons behind the recurrence of floods in Assam. We'll understand the reasons, we'll understand the consequences of floods on Assam, we'll understand the steps taken by the government of India and the solution or way forward. The second article is taken from Indian Express page number 13. Now, in this article, we are going to discuss about a famous or one of the finest diplomats our country has seen, Dubey. Now, we are going to understand his influence on India's foreign policy. The third article is taken from Hindu page number 6. Now, Kerala has become the first village to have People's Biodiversity Register. So, we'll understand what exactly is People's Biodiversity Register. The fourth article is taken from Indian Express page number 11. Now, in this article, students, we are going to understand what is balance of payment and capital account as well as current account. The fifth article is taken from Indian Express page number 11. Now, in this article, we are going to understand China's railway network project which is a part of Belt and Road Initiative, which will connect China and Singapore. So, we'll understand about this infrastructure project. And finally, we shall be discussing few practice questions so that you understand the type of questions that can be asked in the UPSC examination. So, students, let's get started. Students, the title of the first topic is When Waters Rise. Now, in this article, we are going to understand the reasons behind the recurrence or frequent floods in Assam and the consequences, solution, etc. So, we'll have a comprehensive understanding of the floods of Assam in India and what can we do to prevent it. And you can map this under GS paper 3, Disaster and Disaster Management. So, students, in 2016, UPSC had asked this question, the frequency of urban floods due to high intensity rainfall is increasing over the years, right? So, such type of questions can be asked in the UPSC examination over floods. So, what is the context? Now, Assam is one of the states that is prone to severe flooding. Assam faces persistent challenge to reduce the devastating effects of floods. Despite the steps taken by the government of India and the state, the state continues to experience loss of life and property because of floods. And the Chief Minister of Assam uh, has acknowledged the geographical complexities, the geographical topography as the reason behind the increasing uh, incidences of floods in Assam. And it is also very important to have a modern flood management strategy to mitigate the consequence or impact of floods in Assam. This is what the Chief Minister has acknowledged. So, let us try to understand the reasons behind the Assam floods. The first is the geographical and the hydrological factors, students. Now, students, Assam is a state that is drained by more than 120 rivers, Brahmaputra being the biggest river. So, imagine 120 rivers is actually draining the state of Assam, flowing through the state of Assam. So, Brahmaputra starting, it originates in uh, China, flows through Arunachal Pradesh and then into Assam. So, it brings large volume of water. And then the state's topography. Now, you have the state's topography which includes the hills and the flood plains. So, what happens is during rain, the water from the hill flows down and then it completely inundates or fills the flood plains. This is one reason. And second, when the large volume of water is coming from Arunachal Pradesh, the flood or for that matter, the flood plains get completely filled or inundated because of the large volume of water flowing through the state of Arunachal Pradesh. For example, so this is one data which you can mention in the examination. According to Central Water Commission, Assam has one of the highest annual average rainfall figures in India ranging from 2000 to 3000 mm. So, such data students will fetch you 0.5 marks in the examination. So, it is very important that you mention such key fact or data to boost your scoring. This is one reason. 
The second is aging flood control infrastructure. Now embankments. Now what is embankments? Now embankments are structures that are raised to uh, prevent the overflowing of water from a river or let's say a canal. Now the infrastructure built in the 60s and 70s are outdated which means they are not able to prevent the outflow of water from rivers or let's say canals. Right, so this is another reason. Now, the Assam government has noted that the floods in 2023 has claimed more than 50 lives. It has displaced 3,60,000 people and affected over 40,000 hectares of crop area. Second reason, students. Third reason, environment degradation. Now, the urbanization and construction projects, right, the felling of trees, the deforestation has damaged the critical ecological features such as marshes and water channels. And this actually leads to water logging in the region. Now, deforestation and soil erosion in the upstream regions. Now, when in the upstream regions, that is in the hilly regions, if more and more number of trees are uh, cut down, which means the trees now see the trees or for that matter the soil in the upper region they actually store the water right so when the water is flowing it will actually capture the water it won't allow the entire water or volume of water to drain down the hill but now because of deforestation the water is not getting locked and as a reason the water is flowing from the hills and the flood plain is completely getting inundated and then the next is the lack of modern early warning systems. We do not have technology through which we understand the disaster that is uh, that is yet to take place. So here, it is very important that we install modern weather stations and alert systems so that people get to know about the impending flood situation. So these are some of the reasons students which you can mention in the examination. These are the reasons behind Assam's flood. Now what are the consequences? The infra, the first consequence being infrastructure gets damaged, which means the transportation gets completely disrupted, right? So be it the train services, right? Then damage to roads and bridges. Now roads and bridges gets damaged. Electricity supply. This affects the economy of the region because of the uh, electricity shortage. One is infrastructure damage. Now this is very self-explanatory. The second one, impact on common life village and crop inundation now here there's a data or 5000 villages and vast croplands are submerged it displaces thousands of people and it destroys the agriculture output then landslides and shelter issues again it uh, causes displacement and because of which or because of landslides it uh, delays the relief efforts animal loss there's loss to the wildlife or livestock and wildlife. Second consequence. Third, environmental impact. Now, Kaziranga National Park, around 15% of the park gets affected because of the floods in Assam. It leads to animals coming out of their habitat and it leads to further human-animal conflict. Then there's loss of habitat and biodiversity because of floods. This is the third consequence. Fourth, economic and food security. Now, because of floods, critical infrastructure gets damaged, like buildings, power lines, communication systems. At the same time, we have just discussed that how floods uh, causes disruption or destruction of the crops, which leads to food shortages in our country or the region. So these are this is the fourth consequence. So these are the four consequences that we have just discussed. We discuss the reasons. We discuss the consequences. Now we'll understand the steps taken by the government of India to prevent the floods. One is National uh, Flood Commission. This is the first report. Now, this commission submitted comprehensive report in March 1980. It recommended few steps. One is the flood plain zoning. Now, what is flood plain zoning? There are certain zones that are demarcated and on such zones, no activity, no construction activity can take place right or integrated flood management approach now this integrated flood management approach it focuses on the entire river basin it doesn't focus in isolation it focuses on the entire river basin or the catchment area 
Then we have the R Rangachari Committee, which was established in the year 2001. So such type of uh, steps you can mention in the examination students, right? Now, the solutions. Very, very important. The first one is, I will discuss around 10 to 12 solutions. In the examination, you just have to mention around 5 to 6 solutions. That will be more than sufficient. The first one is, you have to revamp. So all the problems that we have discussed, you just have to provide solution to those problems. The first one is, revamping flood control structures, which means you have to upgrade and maintain the existing embank embankments, right? We discuss what is embankments. Now here, you have to maintain and upgrade the embankment to so that the embankments actually prevent the water from flowing out of the river. Then again, you have to build more resilient embankments using modern engineering techniques. That is, you have to incorporate modern technologies, right? The second one, dredging and river management. Now, it is very important to dredge the river. What is dredging? Which means you are removing the silt and sediments from the river. So, let me just help you with the with a diagram, right? So, let's say this is the height of the river. This is the height of the river. And now here, there are sediments in the river. Now, because of the sediments, the water is losing the holding capacity. So, by removing the sediments, the river in or the retaining capacity of the river increases, which actually leads to prevention of floods, right? That's the reason regular dredging is very, very important. Third is integrating indigenous knowledge. Now here, we have to use the traditional knowledge of the local people and then we have to use it so that we prevent the floods. For example, we have to construct flood resistance houses and community infrastructure. Here, it's mentioned stilt houses. Now, what are stilt houses? So this is still coming. So here, this actually uh, prevents or this actually uh, makes sure that the water is not getting stored on the roof of the house, right? So such type of stilt houses can be constructed. Then reforestation and soil conservation. That is, when you are felling the trees, you also need to make sure that you plant more and more number of trees. Now, through planting trees, we can reduce the soil erosion and thus we can increase the holding capacity of water. Then urban planning and drainage systems. Now in the urban cities, it is very important that the uh, drainage system gets improved, right? So it is very important to enhance the urban drainage system so that we prevent the floods or prevent situations like water logging. Then investment in technology. Now the world has made significant strides in technology. So here, in order to prevent floods, we have to integrate technology in the governance. Like, for example, we can use geographic information system and remote sensing through which we can actually assess the flood-like situation and plan so that we can be prepared to handle a disaster. Then, again, uh, we have to make sure that we have to protect the wildlife, right? For example, we have the Kaziranga Nas National Park and we have to protect such corridors where animals exist. Then we have to construct sluice gates. Now what are sluice gates? Now sluice gates are the uh, gates which actually prevent the flow of the water or which actually control the rate of flow of water, right? So for example, there's a dam, right? And when the gates are open, large volume of water actually flows through the gates. So here, sluice gates, they actually control the flow of water and such Construction of sluice gates is extremely, extremely important. Then policy and institutional reforms, we have to integrate flood management. As I told you, we have to focus on the entire river basin and not just in isolation. At the same time, we have to ensure that the uh, environmental regulations and laws are strictly adhered and implemented so that no encroachment takes place. Then there is there are many vacancies in the Brahmaputra. So you have to ensure, the government has to ensure that the vacancies are filled as soon as possible. And finally, community participation and awareness. It is very important to raise awareness among the local communities. And most importantly, the government has to invest massively in the research on climate change impacts so that we understand the underlying reasons and can take preventive steps or solutions to prevent the 
recurrence of floods thereby reducing the loss of life and property and the environmental ecosystem so students in this article we understood the reasons four to five reasons consequences the steps taken by government of india and the way forward or the solution that we can take i hope we have covered each and every dimension associated to the flood issues in us right students students the title of the next topic is dubai doctrine in this article we'll understand what is dubai doctrine and we can map this under gs paper 2 a question was asked in the year 2019 the long sustained image of india as a leader of oppressed and marginalized section nations has disappeared on account of its new found role in the emerging global order so yo once we go through the article i hope you'll be in a position to attempt at least 50% of this question so let's start with the context what is the context ambassador muchkund dubey is been considered or is considered as one of the finest diplomats india has ever got right now we are going to understand about dubey's influence on india's foreign policy right how dubey how ambassador dubey influenced india's foreign policy so we'll understand his insights into the evolution of india's foreign policy especially the transition phase from the decolonization agenda when the world was actually going through a decolonization mode to addressing new global challenges so we'll understand the transformation from this decolonization to emerging new challenges decolonization we know that in the 1950s and 1960s when india got independence india was focusing on supporting global decolonization efforts which means all the countries like south africa that were still reeling under colonialism we were supporting this colonized countries and we are fighting for a decolonized world and india actually took active participation participated in the international forums like the nam non alignment movement etc then new global challenges in the 1960s and 1970s the foreign policy began addressing india's foreign policy began addressing global challenges like the development the disarmament of the uh, mutually uh, mutually assured destruction weapons or mad mutually assured destruction weapons like the nuclear weapons and democratic democratization of the international order like the united nation so india championed the cause of developing countries pushing for a new international economy now what is this new international economic order this order actually seeks to redistribute wealth from the developed countries to the developing countries so the colonizers they actually looted the colonized nations now this new international economic order seeks to redistribute the wealth from developed to developing countries then the pro reform era now before 1990s india's economic policies was characterized by protectionism we were not integrating with the outside world then the industries were controlled by the state then there's limited engagement with the outside world. our focus was on self reliance and we did not depend on the foreign technology but this changed post 1990s that is in the 1990s decade why because india was going through a balance of payment crisis we did not have money to pay for the imports and as a reason we had to undergo significant economic reforms in the form of lpg liberalization privatization and globalization now we started to integrate with the outside world for example the uruguay round of talks under the general agreement on tariffs and trade right now this agreement was very very important why because this agreement sought to reduce reduce the tariffs now reducing the tariffs actually promoted promoted trade so this was very very important for the developing countries now when it comes to nuclear diplomacy now india when india became a free nation india was advocating or supporting 
global nuclear disarmament which means we wanted that the world should not have nuclear weapons at all nuclear disarmament for example in the 1980s we were advocating elimination of all the nuclear weapons and to make a world nuclear free but this shifted once the cold war ended in the year 1991 now because of the regional security right for example we had a threat from china and pakistan now in order to strengthen our security india tested nuclear weapons in the 1998 in 1998 india became a nuclear weapon country so from fighting against the position of nuclear weapons to adopting nuclear weapons this is how our foreign policy changed and why did we build nuclear weapons to ensure national security and strategic autonomy then new international economic order we discussed to address the economic inequalities between the developed and developing nations right so we sought to uh, bridge this gap and to redistribute the wealth from developed to developing countries right then adaptation to globalization right so as i told you the balance of payment crisis actually forced india to adopt the globalization phenomena right so india embraced liberalization which means now we attracted foreign capital as well as technology and this was very very important for india's economic revival and growth then regionalism and south asian cooperation now in order to boost or strengthen the region the south asian region india became a founding member of the south asian association for regional cooperation now for example all india's neighboring countries are part of sarc but because of the enmity between india and pakistan there was or there is no major improvement or significant steps taken under sarc why because of the enmity between india and pakistan right so this is what is mentioned because of the challenges the regional cooperation faced challenges because of india pakistan enmity right now shift to pragmatic multilateralism now what is multilateralism that is multiple still multiple states right are cooperating on issues this is what is mean by or what one understands by multilateralism that is multiple countries are coming together to find solution to issues for example issue based coalition when it comes to let's say climate change the entire world has come under one umbrella right and then aligning with the like minded countries to shape global norms and rules for example we have aligned with like minded nations like usa japan right or let's say france now if you see all these three countries in uh, the 20th century or post india getting independence we were actually against these nations against these nations which means we did not align with the policies of these nations but now in the 21st century in order to shape the global norms and rules we have aligned with these like minded nations why to find solution to the uh, issues like disarmament arms control and non proliferation of weapons these are the issues regional initiatives now as sarc now see in order to strengthen the south asian country or south asian region we focus or we invested our energy in sarc but because of the uh, indian pakistan enmity no progress was done with respect to sarc and as a reason now we are focusing on the sub regional cooperation frameworks other initiatives in order to enhance connectivity and economic integration now, which are these other initiatives we have bimstek bangladesh so bimstek stands for Bay of Bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation now we have countries like india nepal bhutan sri lanka myanmar thailand who are part of bimstek then indian ocean rim association now here this association entails countries like india and sri lanka nepal bhutan myanmar right uh, maldives then mekong ganga cooperation now this mekong ganga cooperation is a cooperation between india and five asian countries 
लाइक वी हैव कैम्बोडिया वी हैव वियतनाम वी हैव म्यांमार वी हैव लाओस एक्सेट्रा एंड देन वी हैव अनदर साउथ एशियन सब रीजनल इकोनॉमिक कॉपरेशन नाउ यो ऑल आवर नेबरिंग कंट्रीज माइनस पाकिस्तान सो वी आर फोकसिंग ऑन दिस इनिशिएटिव सो एज टू स्ट्रेंथन द रीजन एंड एनश्योर दैट वी फोकस ऑन कनेक्टिविटी एंड इकोनॉमिक प्रोस्पेक्ट so here in the conclusion we can say that our indian foreign policy has evolved especially the focus initially being on decolonization to now the focus being on finding solution to the emerging challenges economic reforms nuclear diplomacy and regional cooperation have been key aspects of this evolution so as india continues to rise at the global stage it is very important to balance pragmatic multilateralism with our efforts to make international order normal or which should actually help the world to grow right so this was about the evolution of indus foreign policy and the contribution of ambassador dubey in the evolution of india's foreign policy i hope since you understood this article friends the title of the next topic is kerala village compiles in depth biodiversity register so we'll understand what is biodiversity register and mission life program we can map this under gs paper 3 so this was a question asked in the year 2008 so please try to go through the question and try to understand the type of question that can be asked in the examination so what is the context the villages in kerala have updated people's biodiversity register now what exactly is people's biodiversity register now this register is a comprehensive document it's a document right this is created with the assistance of local people and what does this register do or what does the local people do they record the biodiversity within a specific area what is biodiversity now biodiversity is the variety of all the living beings on the earth living beings include animals plants microorganisms now this biodiversity is very very important to keep our earth or environment in a balanced state right so this is biodiversity now this register it serves as a detailed inventory of various aspects of biodiversity for example there is habitat conservation information about the conservation of local habitats the way of how the local habitat should be conserved then the plant varieties then the domesticated animal breeds then the microorganisms and then the traditional knowledge that is being practiced in centuries to protect or preserve the biodiversity so all these things are included in the register so legal framework the biological diversity act actually mandates the creation of the register so this act actually mandates that the register should be made so as to document the rich biodiversity then the biodiversity management committee created under the same act they actually oversee the preparation and maintenance of the people's biodiversity register very very important point for your prelims then in future there's a plan to establish register in every village under mission life and what is the aim of mission life to conserve the planet through mindful use of natural resources so let's try to understand more about mission life now mission life is a global movement led by india it actually encourages individuals and community actions for the environmental protection and preservation it was launched by the prime minister of india at the 26th cop in 2021 this life mission it actually seeks to transform the collective attitudes of people towards sustainability of environment how through adopting three pronged strategy very important point for your pre now uh, which is this three pronged strategy one is demand second is supply third one is policy what is demand encouraging individuals like us to adopt simple effective environmental friendly practices second enabling industries supply and markets to respond to these changes third influencing government and industrial policies to support sustainable consumption and production this is mission life and this is about the article so in this article you need to understand what is people's biodiversity register the legal framework 
and about mission learning. I hope you understood this article. Students, the title of the next topic is Balance of Payments and in this article we shall focus on current account, capital account, balance of payment and you can map this topic under GS Paper 3. So previous question was asked in the year 2014. So please try to go through the question and try to understand the type of question that can be asked in the UPSC examination. Now what is the context? The context is that India's current account, please focus current account, registered a surplus in the quarter 4 that is fourth quarter of financial year 23 and 24. For the first time in the last 11 quarters, that is in the first time in the last three years, the capital account showed surplus. This is the context. What is balance of payment? For example, every one of you might be having or must be having a balance account, right? Which means how much money you are earning and how much money you are spending. In the context of the country, balance of payment, which means how much money the country is earning and how much money the country is losing out. So BOP is a ledger of a country's transactions with the rest of the world, right? Showing the inflows and outflows of the money. Now positive entries, if the BOP is positive, what does it mean? That the money is coming in, right? Which means we are earning more than what we are losing out. And if the BOP is negative, which means we are spending more than what we are earning. This is what we understand by BOP positive and BOP negative. What is current account? So under BOP, okay, just let me show you here. This is BOP, we have current account and capital account. So what is current account? Record transactions of a current nature subdivided into trades of goods and services. So here, goods and services are traded in the current account. Trade account involves, now when it comes to trade, Involves export and import of physical goods. Physical goods like, you know, like for example, we might import, let's say, Apple iPhone. This is a physical good that we are importing, right? Involves export and import. And let's say, for example, we uh, export, let's say, uh, agriculture, agricultural uh, goods to a foreign country. That is export. So here, physical goods are being imported and exported under the trade account. Now, under the trade account, we also have invisible trade, which means which we cannot see it, but is happening like the services, the transfers, the incomes that are not physically visible. And what is capital account? When we take money from the foreign countries for the investment purpose, let's say foreign direct investment and foreign institutional investor, SII. So, BOP. Export and import of goods, export and import of services, unilateral transfers, income, receipts and payments. Let's say for example, if you are given a loan to a foreign country. Now that country is returning the interest of that loan. It falls under this. Capital account, borrowings and lendings, investments and change in foreign exchange reserves. This is capital account. So the context is, the in the last three years, the capital account for the first time has shown positive that is surplus. Now India had a surplus in the invisible trade like the services, transfers, etc. But a deficit in the trade account. Trade account, the import and export of physical goods. Invisible trade which we cannot see like the transfers and services. So India had a surplus in invisible trade but not in the trade account. The capital account showed a net surplus of 25 billion. The capital account. This one. So India's capital account is always in positive. Current account is always in negative. Historically. Right. Current account has been in negative. Capital has been in positive. But now this is gradually changing. Now here you can see the table. And year wise current account and capital account. Right. You can see the change or difference in numbers. Now let's try to interpret, interpret deficit and surplus, right? Now when we say that we are uh, importing more, right? Which means the trade account or current account is in surplus, uh, sorry, negative. Deficit. Why? Because we are importing more, right? And which when we import more, we have to spend money, right? Now, 
deficits and surpluses right in the normal situation it means that deficit which means it is negative surplus it is good for the economy this is what we understand in the current account do not always indicate negative or positive economic health prima facie we understand that deficit is not a good thing surplus is a good thing but in the current account it does not always indicate negative or positive economic health now having deficit in the current account doesn't mean that the economic health of the country is poor a current account deficit right may reflect strong demand and economic activity when the current account is deficit which means we are importing more here it doesn't mean that our economic health is poor the current account deficit may also reflect strong demand and economic activity which means there is a demand in the domestic market there is demand or the economic activity is booming right and that's the reason we are importing more this also reflects or uh, the current account deficit also reflects positive demand and economic activity current account sur uh, surplus now during the lockdown uh, the current account was surplus what does it mean is it good for the economic health no why in during the lockdown there was no economic activity happening that's the reason india did not import and that's the reason the current account was surplus now current account surplus doesn't mean it is always good so please try to understand the difference between deficits and surplus which means that a developing country like india often has a current account deficit due to high imports of capital goods for capacity building right so in this term it was important for you to understand what is balance of payment current account and capital account and the interpretation of deficit and surplus i hope students you understood this particular concept right students the title of the next topic is why china wants to build a rail network to singapore via southeast asia now students in this article we shall understand what is this ecrl project right what is pan asia railway and debt trap diplomacy of china now this projects can be important from the prelims perspective and that's the reason we'll focus on these aspects in this particular topic right and you can map this under gs paper 2 as well now a question was asked in the 2017 china is using its economic relations and positive trade surplus as tools to develop potential military power status in asia now in this question the topic that we are going to discuss today can be mentioned as one of the forms in which china is trying to develop potential military power status in asia as well as economic powerhouse in the region so <clears throat> let us try to understand what the topic is about now the chinese premier right he was on his visit to malaysia and malaysia china has shown interest to link the railway projects which connects china and malaysia why the objective be to boost regional connectivity now if this topic is in the news it is your duty to open atlas map and focus on the regions between china and malaysia or the entire southeast asian region a map based question can be asked in the examination now this announcement to link the railway project connecting china to vietnam was made at an event for a terminal station of malaysia's east coast railing now what is east coast railing is something we'll discuss <coughs> now this east coast railing again is a part of china's belt and road initiative now what is this belt and road initiative now this is one of the initiatives undertaken by china to enhance infrastructure development in the asian continent african and the south american continent there are two aspects of this belt and road one is the road and the other one is maritime route focus is to enhance infrastructure and ecri is a part of bri now this ecrl can be asked in the prelims examination is a 10 billion project associated with china led pan asian railway network now what is pan asian railway network we shall discuss in some time let's focus on ecrl ecrl now this ecrl network aims to link the southern chinese city 
as the transportation hub, hub of Kunming to Singapore, passing through several Southeast Asian countries. It spans 665 kilometers, connecting Kota Bharu in the east to Port Klang on the strategi strategically significant Strait of Malacca along M Malaysia's west coast. Now, this ECRL is the biggest economic and trade project between China and Malaysia. The freight transport, that is the goods transport along the ECRL will account for 70% of the total revenue generated by the railway network, while the remaining 30% will be derived from the passenger transport. Now, let me show you this image. Here, you get to see that this is Kota Baru in Malaysia and this is Klang region in the or along the Malaysia's coastal region. So this is the ECRL projects in Malaysia which connects China and Malaysia. Right? So again here you need to just note this two names. One is Kanming, the other one is Port Klang and Kota Bar. So here you get to see Klang Klang and Kota Bar. Right? Now, what is Pan-Asian Railway Network? Now, this is a conceptualized plan aimed at enhancing regional connectivity across Southeast Asia. Across the entire Southeast Asia, through a comprehensive railway system, there are three networks or three primary lines. One is Western Line, which extends from Kunming, China, through Myanmar and Thailand, the Central, Laos and Thailand, the Eastern Line, Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand. So, Pan-Asian Railway Network. Very, very important for your prelims. And if it's a means based question, you can mention this network as an example of how China is extending infrastructure in uh, the Asian region, right? Now, what is Pan Asian Railway Network? We have already discussed this. There is proposed line that would link Bangkok, Thailand, and Malaysia and Singapore, right? strategically positioned at the mouth of Strait of Malacca. This is what we discussed in the previous slide. The purpose being to enhance connectivity and economic integration in the region. So, ECRL and Pan-Asian Network. Now, what are the Chinese interests in the region? First is historical and strategic planning. Now, through the uh, Pan-Asian Network or ECRL project, China wants to invest heavily in the region and China wants to gain foothold in the Southeast Asian region. This is one. So that China can have its presence or influence in this region as well. The second is economic and cultural ties. Now, China has strong influence in the Asia Southeastern region. For example, in the year 2023, trade between China and ASEAN. Now, ASEAN is an organization of 10 Southeast Asian countries. The trade in 2023 was $900 billion. Right? This is how China has invested heavily economically in the region as well as there are cultural ties between the people of China and the Southeast Asian country. Infrastructure development for the sake of infrastructure development, China is providing loans to the countries in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia and thereby generating goodwill. So, Regional influence and goodwill. China is trying to have regional influence and by supporting the infrastructure project, China is trying to own the goodwill and most importantly, China is using this economic initiative to enhance its regional engagement. So here, China wants to prove a point that here, Chinese investment in the region is a win-win situation for all. So the Southeast, Southeast Asian countries have this fear of Chinese territorial claims and military activities in and around the Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian region to offset, right, or to uh, abate the tensions of the Southeast Asian countries, China is focusing on the economic infrastructure project, right. I hope students, you understood this particular article, right. Students, now it is time to discuss practice questions. Now, going through these questions will help you understand if you understood the five topics that we have discussed before starting this session on practice questions, right? So, let us start with the first question. 
with respect to people's biodiversity register right kerala or the villages in kerala were the first to have this people's biodiversity register the people's biodiversity register is a document created with the help of local communities to record the biodiversity in the area yes environment protection act 1986 mandates the creation of pbrs wrong biological diversity act of 2002 mandates right so this one is incorrect so the biodiversity management committees are created under the ngd act of 2010 incorrect again this was created under the biological diversity act of 2002 option e is the correct answer next mekong ganga cooperation includes indian which group of countries very simple it is five countries in the asean block so option b is the correct answer question number 3 it is about bop balance of payment the balance of payment is a ledger of a country's transactions with the rest of the world showing inflows and outflows of money yes this is what we have discussed positive entries in the bop indicate money going out of the country right positive entries in the bop when the bop is positive which means the money is actually coming inside the country right so this one is incorrect the current account is subdivided into trade of goods and trade of services yes the capital account records transactions such as fdi and fii yes so again 1 3 4 option b seems to be the correct answer yes answer option b is the correct answer with reference to bop during quarter 4 of 23 2024 these are the statements india registered a surplus on the current account for the first time in 11 quarters yes There was a deficit in the trade account, but a surplus in in yes, exactly. This is what we had discussed. The BOP deficit may reflect strong demand and economic activity. Yes. Option B is the correct answer for question number four. The Pan Asian Railway Network does not pass through which one of the following countries? We have discussed that this Pan Asian Railway Network actually connects China and the countries in the Southeast Asia, India. is nowhere a part of pan asia railway network why because of the frictional relations between india and china so these are the prelims based questions that we have discussed so far now let us focus on means practice question the question is discuss the multifaceted reasons behind the recurrent floods in assam and evaluate the effectiveness of current flood management strategies propose comprehensive solutions to mitigate the impact of floods on infrastructure common lives and the environment so this is a question now you have to start the answer by introduction in the introduction you can mention about the recent floods in assam that has actually wrecked havoc in the entire state of assam leading to loss of lives and property and how it is important for the state to adopt modern flood management system then in the reasons in the body you have to mention the reasons one the geographical factor right so assam is a state that is drained by 120 rivers brahmaputra being the largest river then hydrological factor the topography the hilly regions and the flood plains then the aging flood control infrastructure like the aging embankments right environmental degradation the soil erosion construction urbanization lack of modern early warning system is the reason behind the assam floods or one of the reasons right so mention four to five reasons then you can mention uh the consequences the consequences being it damages the infrastructure roads railways right uh, then uh, it actually also impacts the common lives the people or people die because of floods right then the way it is impacting kaziranga national park the way it is impacting the economy of a country why because the critical infrastructure like roads railways bridges they get collapsed and it also takes a hit on the agricultural productivity why because it damages crops then you can also mention the steps taken by the government of india right the one the national commission on flood management right these are the things that you can mention in the and finally in the solution you have to mention the solutions like revamping flood control structures that is you have to make sure that the 
infrastructure is updated you have to uh, regularly undertake dredging of the rivers integrating that is you have to use the traditional knowledge of people to prevent the recurrence of floods focusing on the uh, forestation reforestation and soil conservation through which we can prevent floods urban planning that is the drainage system of the urban area should be upgraded protecting kaziranga and wildlife that is you have to demarcate the animal corridors and prevent it and then construction of sluice gates through which you can actually control the rate of flow of waters so this is how you can sum up the answer i hope you understood how to write this means based uh, answer for the question that we discussed so students that's it from this session on daily news analysis i hope students you have understood all the five articles that we have discussed in today's session so students uh, my personal suggestion is that please continuously be very very regular in listening to the daily news analysis only by being regular you will get a holistic understanding uh, of the day to day activities or the current affairs right and this will help you in your upsc examination to fetch good marks to have a holistic understanding of the topics and this is the examination so that's it from our today's dna session students if you want us to continue with our dna then please do like share and subscribe to nana nana thank you so much